as glorious as it is here. Allow me to return to the issue of the day, our Kickstarter discussion, looking at the prospects and the projections for the new year ahead, economically as well as on the political scene. We've been speaking to Dr. Sarah Virete, the Executive Director at the Center for Constitutional Governance, and we're now joined by Dr. Fred Mahumza, a seasoned socio-economic commentator and one who is uh, very much knowledgeable in the wheels that run the economy. I'll go straight to Dr. Fred Mahumza. Very welcome to the program. Thank you very much and happy new year viewers out there. Happy new year I year spent too. some time on coffee. Mm -hmm. I should have arrived in time, but not drinking coffee. I was just hey. reading about the was, issues around coffee. I was about to say, <laughs> yeah. wow. <laughs> there seems to be many issues around coffee, uh, despite the fact that uh, we well, shouldn't be experiencing such things because coffee should be able to bring in more money than... Certainly. Certainly. And we need it. We need it. Yeah. Let me just ask you the question. As we enter the new year, I asked this question earlier. Uh, I put it to Dr. Birete. At individual level, there are aspects we deal with, the realigning, mm -hmm. uh, re-strategizing, and then uh, that new energy. Does that ever happen to technocrats? Do they also come into the new year uh, thinking mm -hmm. like us and uh, like we are going to do new things, what failed us the other mm -hmm. year, we are going to you know, trick here and there, or it's a case of uh, we shall implement what we can, execute what within what is within our means, what we can't, let it be. Yeah, interesting question. First of all, for the technocrat, there's the financial year. Ah, uh, yeah. So their new is around the new year is in oh. <laughs> <laughs> budget <laughs> speech. <laughs> so now they're only saying it's half year. Okay. Yes. Now, maybe that gives them false hope mm. that what we haven't done, while me and you are making new year resolutions, uh -huh. they're like, we still have another six months to do. We okay. can do. That's interesting. But maybe I want to believe each one of them at personal level, mm. they make their other decisions. That's right. That I think is one uh, thing to look into. The other one is a lot of um, technocratic work is subjective to the system you are working with. Mm. You can't be one single player on the team and say, I'll score the goal. So a lot of technocratic work Even within government yes. depends on what other government agencies are doing, mm. what budget you have received, That's right. when have you received it. There are quite a lot of complications within the system. Mm. We are just waking up today, you know, we are supposed to take over the monopoly. Mm. It has not. And the issues we are reading in the media are very, very clear for any legal <laughs> mind to have looked into. Yeah. Mm. Because you want to transact in Kenya. Maybe it must be itching right now. There are conditions of operating in Kenya. Yeah. A ten million dollar turnover mm. over three years. Mm. We hadn't done that. You must have a depot in Kenya. You must have retail in Kenya. Now you can negotiate those politically, but not after the fact. So some legal mind should have seen those to say for us to operate this business in Kenya, these are the preconditions. Yeah. We can't wait for three years to make a turnover of ten million dollars. We don't have a depot. Maybe we can build that in six months or three months. I don't know what. Yeah. But where it fails and you have a... Because this thing was politically driven. Yeah. There was no, clearly no business case. Then let the politics take lead. <coughs> let President Ruto and President Museveni sit, sit and have a conversation and, uh, over coffee, or whatever mm. it is. Tea, Kenya grows tea. And say, oh, can you give me some favors here? This yeah. is what I'm trying to solve. But up to today, I haven't seen what problem we're trying to solve. I haven't seen it. So purely it was a political case. Now, that, those guys sitting in New York, those guys sitting wherever, had to rely on the other agencies of government. Mm. The diplomacy part of it, the legal part of it, who raises those issues. So a government bureaucrat sometimes wants to do something. Mm. But really a lot of other things are beyond your control. Mm -hmm. So many times I judge them with caution. Mm. I've sat with them, I've had their pains. Mm -hmm. I remember really struggling with the Minister of Finance <laughs> several years ago. Somebody from Nagri came and said, I have cows to feed. I don't have money. I've been receiving uh, advances from the Indians. They've been giving me feeds. But now for six months I haven't paid them. They have said next week, no feeds. These are live animals. Mm. And what was financing? Wait for next quarter. No, man. <laughs> Next quarter will cover the area, <coughs> but also have animals that need food Excuse me. tomorrow. Mm. Yeah. So he said, guys, let's be realistic. So a technocrat can really face lots and lots of challenges in a government system like ours. Mm. And I think our PSST is also facing the same challenges. And that is uh, 
more like uh, a malaise that has been on for quite a while. Yes. We cannot speak, for example, although it is something that is happening for the very first time. No. We've no. been unable to deal with that particular institutionalized inefficiencies for so long that there must be a rethink. And where does that come from? You see, the best things are systems. And mm. when I finished my first degree in economics, I went straight into computer science. The diploma wow. level, all these applications of uh, word, word. I said, no, I want to understand <laughs> what makes <laughs> computers efficient. Yeah. yeah. What determines the system? I wasn't into so much. I wanted to program because I wanted mm. to understand detail. The coding but the main it. thing I really wanted <laughs> to understand was systems analysis and design. Because mm. everything is a system. That's right. Your blood flow is a system. The heart is where it is. It couldn't be in the legs. Mm. It is right where it is. The abdomen is where it is with all the organs that must be there. So I wanted to understand systems. And now artificial intelligence is taking over the world. But mm. when you look at what are the main things about artificial intelligence, some of these things is learning from the past mm. and improving the future. So I think one of the things that we have relegated to the sidelines in the system of government is lessons that are coming from monitoring and evaluation. Mm. Even monitoring and evaluation itself, we don't really do. People are just in there protecting territories. You look at the indicator that comes through. We hardly factor them into back into the programming. Mm. And now they are calling it really meal. It's no longer monitoring and evaluation. It's monitoring evaluation and learning. It's a meal you need to eat. You need to learn from what you have reviewed. <laughs> this is a country where I think we still allocate money according to the size of the hospital by the number of beds. Mm. And yet we know the number of beds should not be determining the budget that goes to Anyone. the total hospital. Yes. It's the number of patients. Yeah, mm. out patients. And we know th this indicator is available. We even have a thorough put on beds. How many times was this bed used? Mm. Because there is a bed that is used for one day. Yeah. A bed is used for a month. Mm. So even as you have 200 bed hospital, how many patients have used these beds? Because that is the cost driver for that hospital. The patients, mm. the drug, the treatment that they get. So you want to get back to this information and use it when you're allocating money to hospitals. You'll find some come small hospital in Wikwe really deserves more money than a big hospital at Iganga Road. Mm. Because the patients are going there. Especially when you have these roads now, you cannot reach the hospitals you want. So you're locked in with the hospital you have. So this is the monitoring and evolution and learning that we need to bring into government to say what went wrong. How can we make it better? So, computer systems have that learning, artificial intelligence, mm. keeps learning. <clears throat> he then here changes his mind, he now begins to use a new route, Google will notice. Yeah. You are now using a new route. Mm. You change your eating yeah. place, they will notice. Mm. You change your time you live at home, they will notice. Mm. And if you, it is you programming to say, what is my route like? They will know you shifted houses, you are no longer in Nigeria, mm. you now sleep in Somewhere Kansanga. Else, uh, yes. So your new route that they will give you is completely different. So I would wish to see this within government. If we are to manage the turbulent times that the world and our own country is throwing at us. Dr. Birete, listening to Dr. Mhumuza uh, completely flips me and the optimism that we began with, especially for those of us who are looking at the new year and are not technocrats, uh, begins to kind of fade. But we have what has been described as uh, the merger of uh, agencies. One of the interventions that are designed to ensure that some of the inconsistencies in uh, the running of systems is addressed. Does this merger where we see some agencies completely uh, taken over by others or you know uh, swallowed up, does it work or will it even give us an opportunity to ensure that the service delivery is improved on that front? <coughs> well I think the rationalization of agencies would only help in a reducing the public expenditure bill mm. if it happens because it hasn't happened it has uh, been deferred twice without it would be in this year's budget it mm. was deferred to to next <coughs> year and uh, it might not happen because now we are entering the politicking phase and and we have a regime that thrives on patronage so i am th uh, from the governance aspect I think this merger Russia, or rationalization yes. of agencies might not happen because of patronage. Some of these agencies that are really largely non-functional are just patronage outlets to keep people earning allowances and salaries. Mm. 
Yeah. So it, it, we are now in a political phase, and, and, and I doubt. But beyond the rationalization of agencies, we have a, a culture of creating new administrative units for every electoral cycle. Whereas the constitution stipulates that new administrative <coughs> units should Excuse only be created after the census, mm -hmm. and the census happens once in 10 years, we have been creating new administrative units every five years, meaning that even it does not follow data and the national planning of a country that is supposed to be based on the census or the, the, the actual population numbers with their needs mm -hmm. and, and, and the interventions that should happen. So if you look at the size of our public debt, 97 trillion, if you look at the poverty levels in the country, and I want to refer to the Uganda Bureau of Statistics, poverty data or multidimensional poverty report released on, in June 2022. Where you have Karamoja at 68% multidimensional poverty, this is the extent of deprivation per region. Multidimensional poverty. Assessing, but we have the expert here. Yes, we are looking at details of poverty. How deprived are you as a yes. person? Even when you look like you have money. Yes. You know, like now you have a blood bank, but you can't just <laughs> walk in and get blood in the hospital. Somebody uh, needs to connect. For you to be that, that's the deprivation. Yes, you might have your money, but somebody simply tells you we don't have the blood. Yes, now that is an issue you want to solve. There is a systemic, a structural issue to it, as I said, it is systems. Mm. So, Mulago, <coughs> Mengo are hospitals there with their theater, but they need to be directly linked to the blood bank. That is the system you want to check. Okay. Where is the blockage? Mm. Is the problem at the black blood bank funding? Is it Higenya and Sarah and Mums are no longer donating blood? Yeah. You want to understand so is it the type the of blood? Yes. Is it the rare type <laughs> exactly. of blood? Yes. yes. Okay. So you look at Acholi, it's at 64%. Mm. Multidimensional poverty, <laughs> West Nile, 59%. percent Lango 57 Tenso, 56 These are extremes of, of poverty in the country. So when I said that the paper economy does not communicate to the real economy or the the nature mm. the, the the cost the lives of the, the quality of lives of the people these are some of the evidence that contradict the so-called progress that politicians tell people that we are economically progressing so if you have this extent of poverty <coughs> in the regions and the, the poverty goes higher mm. in the rural as compared to urban areas so then who is progressing in the country what progress do we talk about that is not reflected across the bigger section of the, of, of the population? When you look at uh, you know, issues like the World Bank sanctions now, mm. or concessional lenders versus unconcessional lenders, we are more dealing with the risky lenders, mm. China, <coughs> and, and I want to draw an example from Zambia. Zambia borrowed a lot. You say China is a risky lender. Yes, because, we it, be dealing with. Yes, because China, you know, borrowing from China includes mortgaging sovereign property. Our, our airport collections go to an eczema account. <laughs> account you have evidence to, to that? Pay. I mean, really. We, 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 are, we, don't, yeah. we renovated the economy using China alone. There were even delegations to renegotiate. The, the conditions for China lending, and, and I, don't th I don't think they were successful. And we are looking to China to borrow for the pipeline, for the oil developments. We are looking to China to, to, to borrow for ICT, part of the loans that Parliament passed. And we are looking at other unconcessional lenders with high interest rate, mm -hmm. with short-term repayment periods. <coughs> Uh, and all other risks that come to that. Z I was using the example of Zambia. Zambia, yeah. Zambia borrowed a lot from, <laughs> from China under the period of President Lungu for infrastructure development. When you go to the country, you see the infrastructure. Yeah. Unlike our, our situation here, where you need the microscope to trace the value for the money that we borrow. And, uh, <laughs> but China got into trouble. Uh, and they had to get, you know, 
to negotiate with the IMF to, to buy off their own and, and they've just succeeded. I think one year ago, and they are still renegotiating. They haven't fully realized. They haven't executed. really. Yes, they, yes. They haven't executed. Because the sovereign property was mortgaged to China. Interesting there. That is a date structure or architecture that Uganda also may be grappling with because at the end yeah. of the day, most of the money, according to the Minister of Finance, is going to date. And as we say that service. social intelligence is not something that has just popped up. Mm. When you read through, these things began in the 50s. Yeah. They have been there. <coughs> what lessons do you draw from similar experiences? Now, we're already telling a number of African countries, and working on this really with the colleagues mm. at the continental level. What lessons can we draw from those who have failed to negotiate their debt yeah. so that we draw a template for those who are coming in? Mm. Last week, Ethiopia defaulted. Yeah. We, IMF has already listed a number of 22 African countries that are going into default soon. Now, that stress is for many, but sometimes we ignore it and because we are just trying to hide professional terminologies away mm. because they will bring the reality on the table. You take a panado when you have pain, but mm. the doctor said, well, you know, this pain needs to be dealt with from the source. The moment you restructure your debt, professionally you are getting into debt distress. Mm. Now, you may want to say, is Uganda in debt distress? Somebody will tell you no. But we have been restructuring. Debt refinancing is actually restructuring. Yes, uh, yeah, it's mm. part of restructuring. Yeah. Arrears is debt default. Yeah. Mm. You have not paid your creditors. Mm. You have not paid your suppliers. Now, you might hide these terminologies, but that's taking a panado for something that you really wanted a doctor to say, not just a microscope and mm. all those things that are in a, a, a lab of a hospital. You need to go and examine yourself. Now, once that information comes through, you'll have a better source of responding because mm. you have good source of information to take your decisions on. And that takes us back to the restructuring, to the rationalization. Mm. Rationalization, really, we are discussing the medicine. That's a medicine of saying there is a problem of debt. Mm. There is a problem of the government budget not mm. being able to meet. The revenue side is not matching with the expenditure. Mm. And you're not going to just sit and say, I'm going to cut budgets. Now, if you cut budgets, but you don't cut the driver of the cost, you have not solved the problem. Mm. You're creating arrears. Mm. You have to really remove these entities that drive the cost and not just cut their budgets. Yeah. Because you cut the budget of police. Mm. Police still needs to move. You got the budget of a certain agency. That agency is still renting. It still has staff. Mm. Those are the cost drivers. So rationalization is saying, do what we did 30 years ago. Structural adjustment. Mm. Mm. That led to retrenchment. Let go these institutions. Mm. That is the only way to let go of that cost. Yeah. You don't rationalize the, left, the right hand side of the budget, which is the numbers. Mm. But you also want to go to the left side, which is the items. We have all done this for budgets. Mm. I thought I was going to have 200 guests for this function. I don't have the money. <laughs> you reduce the guests. You go through the menu. Yeah. Scale down the menu. You change the venue. Now you are dealing with the budget issue. Mm. Yeah. So rationalization is really speaking to that. But the bigger part is the structural adjustment. People blame it privatization, liberalization. I don't know what. Now that was the medicine. The, don't lose sight of the word. We are restructuring or adjusting the structure of the economy. Mm. That's why they call it structure adjustment. It is the structure of the economy you want to readjust because debt has made it inefficient mm. to meet the foreign exchange obligations, <coughs> to meet the job creation, to meet mm. the growth obligation. So our economy's growth of 6% and below is because of the structure of the economy. And that's what rationalization is a small speck of addressing that underlying major issue. And I'm hoping this year, mm. as we said, we take these tough decisions. And these are not tough decisions for technocrats, for parliament, mm. for even cabinet. They sit right on the docket of the Minister of Finance, Allow me General Yoweri Museveni. Allow me to stay with you on that. Do you think <coughs> Ramadan Gobi is taking the tough decisions when it comes to realignment and ensuring that the economy gets to be gets to stand as strong as it should be you might be having an understanding of the workings of the system yes. to help us understand exactly where he is because no doubt his credentials are good 
he comes from uh, Macquarie University Business School as a fine lecturer of economics that works. Is his idea working? I think it is asking too much of a technocrat. Yeah. It's because as I've said, mm. <laughs> a pilot is the pilot in the cockpit. Yeah. Okay. But he has to pick instructions from a system, as we've said. Mm. And Ramadan Gobi and uh, his uh, boss, Honorable Kasai, as I've just mentioned a while mm. ago, yeah. are the co-pilots. The real pilot of the economy is the, the president. president. Mm. As Baganda said, mm. we have seen records of mm. Ramadan Gobi taking decisions yeah. and his minister that have been reversed. Mm. Even this supplementary that we just passed, the 3.5 trillion, it was yeah. very clear. A lot of things were presidential directives. Mm. Now, what is Ramadan Gobi and Honorable Kasaida supposed to do to a presidential directive? Take it back to the president. And I have been there. We used to do these kinds of things. Mm. We would go back to the president and say, Mr. President, we can't eat our cake and still have it. Mm. This is the situation. Yeah. If we follow all your directives the way they are, we need 3.5 trillion. If we raise it through domestic borrowing, we we'll already have passed what we plan to borrow the whole year. That's right. But we still have these concerns to borrow for in the coming years. Security, you have these priorities for us. Infrastructure, social services, education and health cannot be debated. The roads are now all they need money. Mm. You have just said another extra 1 billion per district. Mm. We agree with you on this. But now these things, how do we go about it? Can we revisit your directives? And M7, I know, always gave us an ear and gave us an ability. So the, the technocrats need to go back to who is the decision maker in this country. It's going to be the president. The president can even take decisions on parliament. He's the docket holder. Yeah. Mm. Now, the executive three arms of government does not mean they are all independent. It's like I'm sitting on this chair, it has four legs. Mm. The president still can have a conversation mm. and say, this is my situation. Honorable Banita Among with your parliamentary commission. How do we go about this? Mr. Chief Justice, I know you sit there, but we need to run this economy together. We need to run this country together. I have a security problem here. They have had these conversations. Mm. We saw his letter on uh, the mosque. Yes. Meaning some things can be discussed. I'm waiting to see some of those conversations between the president and the technocrats and the other political leaders taking decisions. Otherwise, this economy will leave us. An economy can disappear like a storm. You have a strong economy today. Everybody was cherishing the Ethiopian economy. Yeah. It has defaulted. All yeah. of a sudden, it's uh, a different and story And the default altogether. chases you out of the market. Sarah, is there a possibility that uh, technocrats can have their day when consulting the president? Is there a precedent that has been set where, for example, a supplementary budget has been uh, brought in and then uh, either technocrats go back to the president to discuss it and he has agreed to the fact that it shouldn't pass as it has been brought? Is that, possibility? Is that, is that possible? Yes, but who are the technocrats that are supposed to drive the economy? We have spent two years mm. without a Bank of Uganda governor. And no, what I've, does I've that come mean? to believe an economy can run without no, no, a no. governor. No, no, no. Why? Why do you believe <laughs> you are adjusting <laughs> to the abnormality? It's like okay. driving you, your you car with Mumbwa. Yes, that tire will trick you, but you, there is going to you be. You are a just day. adjusting <laughs> to to the abnormal situation. Because, because what yeah. does the absence of a substantive Bank of Uganda governor mean? Mm. I, I know people have argued that we have an, <coughs> a, a, a very competent. The deputy, deputy mm. governor. But why did the framers of the constitution state that there should be a governor and a deputy? And both of them, of course, are supposed to be competent. First, you so you cannot say that yeah. we have one competent, we don't need another. Both of all, all office bearers are supposed, uh, are supposed to be supposed competent. To be competent yeah. So this means that the acting governor has been denied the independence and protection of the, of the office by, as enshrined in the constitution. Mm. He can easily be um, twisted because he does not have the protection of an office. He's just, an office has been lent to him. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and that means that his decisions can be ignored. Uh, and, he, and the purpose is to um, twist that office. That's why we don't have a governor. Before you continue on that point, is it possible at any one point that the deputy governor's decision-making process can be impaired because of the roles that he has to take on as acting governor. 
He's not even acting governor. There is nothing or rather, like such a Yeah, he's just a deputy he's governor. He's deputy governor. We don't have But you know, as we have said, you have a, a senior pilot and a co-pilot. Now, the co-pilot cannot become the senior pilot. Yeah. But in the absence of the senior pilot, mm. the co-pilot is the pilot. And as we stand right wrong. now, is there the possibility that at any one time, either in the last one year, the decisions that were supposed to be taken by the deputy governor as enshrined in his... Uh, what can I call it? The job description could have been impaired because he has to. The, the take issue care of you other need issues. to look at mm -hmm. is denial of the independence of, of that his office. In, of his office, meaning that he's arm twisted, and he cannot take, he cannot put his foot down and say, "I cannot do this." He will be reminded that he's not a governor after all, because in the absence of a governor, the president is the governor. <laughs> He might say he's not arm twisted. Yeah, of was, course he can't say, he but here. this is my analysis. I think my just quick input into this yes, is it's a process. How long you, you, should you, this how process? Long should no, how long not the process, process of creating. Be? I'm talking about the process of mm. making monetary policy. Okay. It requires minds, mm. like a quorum of it judges. It has a team. Yeah. Like a quorum of judges. Mm -hmm. The moment you go up court for appeal, Supreme Court, you need more than one judge. Yeah. yeah. So the creation and the framers of that institution did not mean one or the other. It means there is going to be a team of people yeah. sitting mm. to make yes. a decision. Yes. So the governor is so absent. The, the means, quorum is lacking. Means that the quorum. There is that value that you're not going to get when you have those two people and by the way it is monitoring the policy committee. Mm. Now it has one person missing. It's still the policy the committee is there. And we are taking the brunt. But what if that other extra mind had was a certain there. experience that was not there? Because even doctors only are going to do an operation. Not one of them is going to say, this is what I'm yeah, going to course. do. Yeah. Yeah. They sit and then one will say, Concerns. I saw this particular case yeah. in Amdat. Mm. No, I had a similar experience in Sri Lanka. Now, that knowledge beefs up to say, should we or should we not? So you're missing out that extra input into that process. I'll give each of you a minute going forward. If you were in positions like that of the deputy governor, uh, the positions like uh, Ramadan Gobi's uh, permanent secretary position and secretary to the treasury, looking ahead 2024, what would be the areas that you think will have the potential to help us steady the ship? Well, the first political area you need to look at in terms of stabilizing the economy is corruption. We have talked about uh, ambi ambiguous expenditures in the supplementary budget mm. that clearly point to corruption. <coughs> I know the president in his four priority areas pointed at corruption, but as a citizen watching a uh, fountain of honor, I think that if he lacks ability to deal with his ministers involved in a Karamoja saga where evidence was visible and allowed, <laughs> he has no business telling Ugandans that he can fight corruption. The second issue is to cut down the size of government mm -hmm. so that we reduce expenditure and develop the economy. For me, that's my major take on, on the economy. Dr. Mohamza? My take uh, out of my experience is uh, economic decisions are political decisions, but with technical aspects. So the technocrats need to know their role in decision making within government. Mm. Raise all the technical issues with objectivity. The subjective part is the politics. But make sure at the moment, at the time when the politicians become subjective, my mm. region, my people, the corrupt, <laughs> the, all the technical aspects are clear. Yeah. That every decision they take, the consequences of that decision mm. are well laid out for them. Okay. That would be my take. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Fred Muhumza, for the perspective and uh, enlightening us on some of the workings of uh, the technocrats who are responsible for steering the ship of uh, economy Uganda. We do hope we do not run into unstable waters. And many thanks to you too, Dr. Sarah Birete, Executive Director at the Center for Constitutional Governance, for the perspective that uh, you have shared.